Hello everyone and welcome to 1v1 with Boss Rush Games. I'm your host, Celeste Roberts. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Stephanie Klimov, also known as J.E. Klimov, a sci-fi fantasy author and contributing writer for Another Zelda podcast. Welcome! Hey, thank you for having me. I'm very excited about just saying it. I've been looking forward to it all week. Thank you for being here and making time for this because you are so funny and full of life and so interesting and so sweet and I, I could not wait for this interview, Stephanie. Oh, thank you. Giving me a lot of credit there. <laughs> you do a lot. You, I, I admire people who can commit to writing novels or anything mm-hmm. in addition to dealing with everything life throws at us. Mm-hmm. And I would like to know, are you allowed to say what J.E. Klimov stands for? Or do you just like those letters? No, yeah, we can start off with that. It, um, it's, a, it's a long story, but I'll condense it. Um, initially, I wanted a pen name, Julian Elliott. Um, I always love those names. Um, Julian Edelman, we, uh, former Patriot um, player. Um, but I, that's a name I wanted to give to a son if I ever had a son. Um, but... Things didn't work out that way. I I do have a son, different name. Uh, And I also did some research. And while it might kind of not sound so fair as a woman, but I did research that sometimes, you know, a male name or, you know, male pen name in in the fantasy genre sometimes might sell better. And I I was just playing around with it. I was new to the whole writing space. Um, So I decided to go by Julian Elliott. That's all it was supposed to be. And then when I submitted my first novel to a bunch of publishers and I got, I signed with um, Silverleaf Books, that's my publisher, you know, I, I got a bit of guidance saying, you know, the problem is when people flip to the back of the book and see your picture and see that you're a girl, it'll can kind of confuse them so I he, he encouraged me to shorten it and abbreviate it so it's now J.E. Klimov so that's the long and short of it <laughs> I really I love seeing letters for names I think it adds some kind of mystery, mystery? yeah I like it I'm, I'm glad I was steered in that direction because I was very green with with um you know how publication even works so I'm happy that it ended up that way I love that. And I, I want to start off. So we started with that and I want to just get to know you and I'm sure listeners and your, your fans of your books would love just to, whatever you're willing to share about your hobbies, your interests, what's a day in the life of Stephanie like? Yeah, I was, I was trying to think about what's the best way to kind of introduce myself. And it, it's actually a lot harder um, than you would think. And I would just like to describe myself as a, you know, a, a millennial that has just entered her 30s um, with an awesome son and fur babies. Um, I'm a pharmacist by trade, um, clinical pharmacist, um, been in school for many, many years. But I also have a very creative side, which is funny. I've got a lot of comments like, oh, you're very clinical, you're analytical. How can you be creative at the same time? I'm like, actually, it comes pretty easy to me and it provides a you know, good balance. Um, growing up, I always loved drawing. That was my first love. I drew comics. I was into manga a little bit. Uh, I drew manga style comics. When I was in high school, I wouldn't say I have like an attention deficit disorder, but I for some reason felt like I need to multitask. So when my teacher would be going on in class, I would actually be either drawing my novel or if I could tell she was kind of looking at me, I would be writing my novel, but it would be me pretending to write my notes. Um, so a lot of my creativity stemmed from junior high to high school and I kind of saved it away, put a, you know, I put a pin on it um, while I went to pharmacy school. And then in 2017, one of my New Year's resolution was, I'm going to finally write that novel. So, That's awesome. Uh, so what, what else helps you to get out of the monotony of the day besides writing? Do you have any other hobbies that, that fuel you? Mm-hmm. Um, when the weather, um, it works for me because I'm in New England. Half the year is just freezing or snowy. But I love spending time outdoors. Um, when I was younger, you know, when we were younger, there wasn't a lot of internet, iPad, iPhone. So I would literally wander around the woods in my backyard. My parents were like, all right, go play outside. Um, And that kind of 
you know, carried with me through adulthood. I like to run outside. I love hiking on trails. Since I moved into the Metro West area of Massachusetts, I've been checking out multiple hiking trails, bike trails that follow along uh, rivers with, you know, beautiful sightseeing and stuff like that. Um, So anything outdoorsy, you know, gives me a lot of fresh air, kind of resets my thoughts. Um, I also really like to uh, cook, but I'm better at baking. Um, I'm a big fan of anything to do with food, uh, for those that are on, you know, the boss rush, um, discord, I'm always chiming on the snack tendo. And when I first started listening to the, you know, the boss rush network, um, I think it was Nintendo power block, right? Um, mm-hmm. I was listening, it was my, fir- like my first episode I was listening to. So I had no idea like what to expect. And I remember Ed talking about snacks all the time. I'm like, why are they talking about snacks and not Nint- Nintendo initially? But I, <laughs> I grew to love it. I was like a big fan of Ed. I'm like looking forward to his next snack review. <laughs> um, I actually just bought the chili lime sun chips, um, today and it's delicious, but anyway, I'm getting off topic. So um, okay. I like always welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Baking and cooking also is a hobby. And then lastly, gaming. Um, I watched my cousin play video games when he lived with us growing up when I was too young to play. And my parents, with reason, I'm sure they had their reasons as parents, like I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to play video games until a certain age. Then I got Nintendo 64 as my first console. And I always wanted to play Ocarina of Time because I saw my cousin play Ocarina of Time. So big Zelda fan and I would get lost playing those games and it's because of those games that, you know, really just immerses me in a world and I just feel at home. You just give me the warm fuzzies. <laughs> a great memory. I'll go back and talk fondly of it every time. I think, I think there's something so special about the games we play in our childhood, which of course we, we might have a little bit of those nostalgia tinted glasses whenever we revisit some things, but yeah. Gosh, Ocarina of Time. Yeah, it's it's the game that started my, that kickstarted my writing. I would say career, but not as a kid, it's not a career. But um, it was originally a fan fiction because this is before Twilight Princess came out, and I'm like, oh, what would happen, you know, if you know Ganondorf was sealed away, and he, you know, ma- many many years later he'd break free. Granted, little did I know at that time that's kind of the ever cycling story of the Legend of Zelda franchise. But in my mm-hmm. mind, I thought I was a genius and figured it out by myself. So I wrote a fanfic of what would happen if Ganondorf came back. And then Twilight Princess came out. And then I realized that I pro- if I want to publish my own work, I should probably change a few things. So it became my own story, but it started from that. And I have a lot of my ideas um, coming from video games and they've inspired me so much. Okay, I want to know how Ocarina of Time inspired your your writing. I want to know just is is your first book based on anything from Ocarina of Time? Yep, my first novel, the Aeonians. It's a play on words. I think the Greek word um, that means you know timeless. I, I love looking up words in different languages and seeing what they mean. I'm really huge on that. So you know, in, in the end of Ocarina of Time not talking about how the timeline split, but, you know, Ganondorf is sealed away. So, you know, in my novel, I took some traits of um, dungeon exploring. I found that very interesting, you know, different elements. I like, the, you know, exploring the power of the elements. Um, you know, the traditional good versus evil. And I like the concept of the medallions or um, the stones, Kokiri's emerald, you know, Goron's mm-hmm. ruby and so on. So in my novel, the Aeonians, except I kind of inserted myself in there. So it actually features a kind of tomboy princess that really doesn't want to be a princess. Um, and her kingdom undergoes uh, a siege from an ancient enemy that was sealed away 200, 100 or 200 years ago. Um, and they kind of take over the land and she needs to recover these four elemental stones that control wind, water, earth, fire. And she needs to go to each temple, so to speak. But I kind of changed it up so it's not as obvious and monotonous that it came from a green of time. Um, she collects them all and she ends up kind of collaborating with one of the main antagonists because I wanted to create a likable antagonist, so to speak. I don't want evil for evil's sake. Um, Mm -hmm. And actually, by the end of um, the first novel, the antagonist, his name is Bence, became my personal favorite character because he's so flawed that I actually made the sequel primarily from his point of view. Stop it. I love that. And his hair is fiery red. You can wonder where that came from. (laughs) (laughs) There are a lot of redheads out there. Yeah. They're not all bad guys either. (laughs) 
I I personally love a sympathetic villain because I want to know your I want to know their motives. I want to understand them. Yeah. And it's funny you bring that up, Stephanie, because I was talking to some people um, recently. It was actually the guys from the EXP cast about sympathetic villains and evils for eagles, evil for evil's sake. And some of them, it was kind of a, a split decision. Some of them really like the sympathetic villains and some of them like the evil for evil's sake. Do you, do you have a preference or do you find there are games or books that do one or the other really well that you can think of? I think old and old, for me, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just very low maintenance, but I, I, I can go with either one. I think it depends on the situation and the story. Like I've seen and read books, um, movies, games where the villain is just bad because that's what he wants to do. And mm-hmm. it doesn't make the story any less good if, if there are other elements, if there's growth on the protagonist standpoint. However, over time, I just find a greater appreciation for those where I can actually put myself in the perspective of the antagonist, especially when the antagonist thinks they're doing the right thing. Like that's when it gets very interesting for me. So I'll enjoy any <laughs> type of situation of where the antagonist is coming from, but I just feel like there's a you know greater depth, a greater appreciation when there is a motive because ultimately, you know, we're all human. Well, unless I guess it's a monster bad guy, but now I'm just kind of going to my rabbit hole. But, you know, we all have reasons why we do things. And I'm really into the psychology of you know, why, why people the way they are. Um, like my character, Benz, he, he grew up kind of in, in that imprisonment. So all he knew was his parents' side of the story where this evil king and queen and princess, you know, took their land away and, and jailed them for, for no reason. So he thought he was fighting for, you know, his parents' right to the land back. So he only had one perspective. Um, and so when he goes to the outside world and starts speaking with people and seeing the cruelty that his parents are inflicting on the, you know, in that country, he starts realizing, you know, wait a minute, let's pump the brakes here. What's really going on? So That is really cool. And you bring up, I guess this is maybe me getting a little philosophical. You just make me think about how during wartime. Yeah we might think we're the good guys, but then the, the bad guys think that we're the bad guys and they're the good guys. Yeah. It, and we, it, you know, if we think that we're doing the right thing, but what are the consequences of our actions and how do they play out on the other side? And even though we might come in with good intentions, it might yeah, negatively affect others. So. Oh my gosh. So what are some of your favorite books? I would love to know. It's funny. It's it was probably one of the hardest questions for um for me to think about because even though I'm a writer, oh this is like such a bad thing to admit. I might get uh, um criticized for this, but I actually don't read too much. Um, but it's because you know I've got a lot of other things going for me. Um, but one story that had stood out for me, and I read it a long time ago, and I always kept the copy to go back to it was, and then there were none by Agatha Christie. It's mm. such a classic. I don't write mysteries. I don't think I'm, you know, you need to be pretty brilliant to write a, a convincing mystery. But Agatha Christie just has a um, a great writing style, very suspenseful. Um, it kept me guessing on, you know, who was the murderer the entire time. So, but, you know, other than that, I really don't have like a particular go-to author or a go-to book. Um, and in recent years, I've actually stuck with reading and enjoying books from indie authors. I've kind of decided to dedicate whatever little time I have to read to those that maybe might not be on the number one New York, you know, bestseller list, you know, so. Gosh. And actually, yeah, I dedicated oh, my blog, sorry. No, I dedicated okay. a blog that I have to interview um, indie authors and write reviews on their books when I can. Okay, I was poking around on your website. And so is, how often are you able to do that? I went on a bit of a hiatus in 2020. I just think it's a bit ironic that during the pandemic where people seem to have more time, I actually spent the least time writing and creating. I don't know, maybe I hit a writer's block or something. I really struggled. But now I'm trying to push out maybe one one or two a month. Um, I just published an interview um, with Carrie Davidson, a Canadian author. She's amazing. She's hilarious. Um, I interface with her on Twitter. She also has a graphic novel too. I'm going to be interviewing her work on that later. And I'm actually also working on the interview for um, MJ Kuhn 
from AZP because she's got a book coming up too. It's her debut novel. So that's going to be published in the beginning of April. Oh, I'm so excited. I I love that we have two published authors on the AZP team. Yeah, it's great. And I always want to, I mean, not that I really have a lot of clout online, but whatever I can do, I want to be able to bring others up because there's a lot of, you know, negativity and unhealthy competition, especially online. So I want to create an environment where like, hey, authors helping authors, you know, like if you have a message or just you want to share the joy of writing your first book, I would love to provide a platform for it. Um, And like I said, um, I also do book reviews, not in exchange for a free book. Like I just say, if you want your book to be reviewed, just let me know. I'll buy it myself because I want to support you. And, you know, I I want people to be able to have access to all these different stories because I feel like kind of like with indie games too, there are just so many out there. How can someone be able to find, find them all or at least a good chunk of them, you know? There's just so many good stories out there and games too. (laughs) There are. And I find like indie games, they've been around for a long time, but they're really ramping up. And I think the switch is one of the best platforms for them. Absolutely. I um, initially got some games to put on my um, list from um, another podcast. Cause I started listening to podcasts a lot last year, again, during the um, quarantine, it's called the left behind game club. So it's like a, a game book, a book in a book club style and um, very funny cast there. And I started playing a lot of games that they were talking about. And then um, that's how I got involved with all listening to all the other blogs. But, and now <laughs> what I do, this might be borderline unhealthy, but now I'll um, turn on the Nintendo Nintendo shop on the switch, like once a week and <laughs> scroll through for any indie games that are on sale and I'll buy it. Actually, this is not, well, it, it's not an indie game, right? Um, the makers of Soma, they're just like a traditional you know, that's a great question. And I'm going to put you on the spot, but like speaking of sales, because the Talk the Walk for Soma was one of the first podcasts outside of AZP that I listened to. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I kept my eye on it and it was on sale on the PlayStation Store for two ninety nine. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put on my big girl pants and play Soma. And if I can do it, you can do it. And, and to answer your question there, Frictional Games, AB, is a Swedish independent video game developer. Okay. So I think so, yeah. I would say that classifies them as indie games. They're a privately held company, if okay. anybody's wondering. <laughs> <laughs> they have 25 employees as well. But, yeah, Soma. Soma, oh, my goodness. Did you also play on safe mode like I did? Yes. I just, I I had to. I know there's a lot of hardcore gamers are like you're not getting the full experience i'm like listen the experience is in the story i don't need to be hiding in a cabinet from a monster for 10 minutes until it passes um i actually had one of my friends sorry to go on a tangent i would only play soma when that friend came over so they could sit next to me on the couch while i played and you know if like either an enemy I forgot what the guy, character's name is. He was like a doctor that came near you. Your screen would go all fuzzy. And... Oh, oh, the, the Japanese guy. I, no, wait, was it the one with the tentacles out of his face? No. That's Terry the, Akers, like, maybe? Terry Akers. But there's someone else that wanted you to, to kill the thing at oh, the end. Oh, oh, at the Gosh. end. Oh, my goodness. I know jo- I'm being super Johan, Johan or Johan, something Johan, like yeah. That. Sorry, listeners, you're hearing me babble and not figure out names and stuff. But the point is, is if you go near him... Or an enemy, your screen will shake and get all fuzzy. Just that alone. I was like hiding behind my controller curling into a ball. It's my fault she played that game. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> but I will conclude that that has actually been one of the best stories that I've encountered in a game, excluding all things Zelda. It really has been. So I have to, oh, you to thank, actually. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It inspired me so much. I, I even wrote a piece for Boss Rush on it because... Um, I I was comparing it to this short story called I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream and just AI taking over the pros and cons. And, okay, I have to put you on the spot, Stephanie. Would you have your brain scanned for a shot at immortality like that, even if it's a virtual immortality? <sighs> Probably not. Um, I'd be very happy for anyone that wants to do that. But I feel like, you know what? I was born in this life. 
then there will be a time where I need to say goodbye and it, that's it. It is what it is. Um, I don't need a, a virtual version of me somewhere out there. <laughs> so I'm good. Yeah. I, I kind of wonder because, oh my gosh, listeners, you're going to have to bear with us for a second. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's just with all the different copies of Simon and oh, these options you have to make. Do you let them linger? Do you, do you uh, let them rest in peace? Do you, I don't know. Exactly. It's, it, it puts you in a little existential crisis, right? Like what is the true meaning of your, yourself? Are you only yourself? right now or could you still be yourself when you're a digital copy of yourself you know I don't know and then you know I started thinking about my like my in my phar- pharmacy medical background training my car how does that work with like neurons and memory and mm-hmm. you know, I, I lay awake at late um, at night many many nights after that game trying to figure it out I could never do it I would love to know about your pharmacist journey do you want to talk about that I can talk about that. Um, and I just want to preface this with, I love you, mom and dad. Uh, but I was not interested in pharmacy ever. <laughs> um, I was looking into a medical career when I was younger. My dad's a chiropractor. He's retired now. Um, my aunt is an acupuncturist, well, mostly holistic and Eastern medicine. But, you know, I wanted to just be an MD, you know, um, or because I liked art, you know, work with some sort of medical imaging or I don't know, even some like CSI type stuff. Um, anyway, I was applying to college colleges like BU, um, St. Anselm's, um, on pre-med program. And then my mom got a mass college of pharmacy flyer in the mail and she goes, Oh my gosh, Stephanie, you should try being a pharmacist. You go to school for six years, you get a doctor degree. And she was very enthusiastic for me. And, you know, again, you know, thank you to them for, encouraging me to get a good education, but I just wasn't really hot for it in the beginning. I was a bit hesitant. Um, I'm not into chemistry. I wasn't a big fan of, when I say drugs, I mean, I understand that some is very medically necessary. It just wasn't kind of, I'm not into chemistry. I'm not into medication. I want to focus on, you know, physiology and anatomy. Um, But anyway, so I, while I went to pharmacy school, I got a job at a local CVS pharmacy as a um, tech and then an intern. And it was always a fun time being an intern at a retail pharmacy. A lot of stories. And then when I graduated, I signed with a, you know, a retail pharmacy and I worked there for a couple of years. Um, And I will say that in the future, someday I would like to write a office like or office based story, but from a pharmacy perspective. Like, I love The Office. I love it. I don't know how I'll make a book version of it, but it's going to be a pharmacy version of The Office in a book. It's going to happen. We are friends on so many levels. <laughs> and Yeah, and it's not, you know, dumping on retail pharmacy. I think everybody, especially retail anything, right, they'll have those stories. I look up memes for retail all the time, and they're, some of them are just so... It's not funny at the time, but it's hilarious to exchange stories later. Maybe another time I'll share a couple with you, but those are slated for a future book. Um, Anyway. Love it. I love it because I think uh, I love The Office, first of all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yesterday I I joked that I looked like Angela Martin for work Mm -hmm. and then I changed my shirt and I felt like I looked like Pam Beasley, but I didn't post a picture of me in that shirt because it had my company's logo on and I don't oh, want any weird people on the internet to find me <laughs> but okay who's your favorite office character or characters I guess all right you know I kind of thought about my head for a while but you know when it's all said and done I, I gotta give it to Dwight at first I found him super annoying in the beginning but goodness I, I love that man <laughs> it's just so funny um Let's see who else. I mean, you know, obviously I love Jim. I just love when he looks in the camera all the time. I feel like I start looking into an invisible camera when I'm having one of those moments. And then I feel silly for doing that. Um, but yeah. You know, Dwight, i um, trying to think the counting team. Like, I, you know, Kevin's funny, the dynamic between like, um, Ke- Oh, the, the dynamic between Oscar and Angela, um, how they're like frenemies almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how they have very different beliefs too. Like one's super conservative and one's opposite and they kind of 
don't really like each other, but they're still good friends. So, yeah, especially, okay, spoiler if no one's watched The Office, especially later in the seasons when he really helps her out. Exactly. Yeah. So, I was very sad when The Office left Netflix, but that's all right. I needed. There are other ways to to watch it. (laughs) Yeah. There it's it's floating around out there. Yeah, the office will always be near and dear to my heart. And this is also where I know I've now become an old person, meaning 10 years from now, I'll still be watching the same shows, playing the same games, listening to the same music, and I'll be like, oh, you youngins don't know early 2000s, 90s, 80s music or games or whatever, the office. And I'll be like, what's the office? And then they'll make fun of me for being lame and outdated. But I don't care. I love my office dearly. (laughs) I I tend to watch a lot of the same shows. Do you watch a lot of TV or do you have time to watch a lot of TV? No. And it probably is out of habit. I know I'm kind of getting off topic about pharmacy, but TV is a good discussion too. Um, I grew up with only being allowed to watch a half hour of TV every day. And you know what? Looking back on it, I'm glad that was the rule. Um, The downside is I didn't have a lot of pop culture knowledge when my friends were talking like when they're talking about lost I'm like I don't know sorry um now that I'm older you know and I have access to all these streaming services I'll really cling on to one or two shows and that's really it It just kind of satisfies you know that that need to watch tv um some people really benefit from just decompressing with it but I get really antsy if I just sit and take in entertainment that's why i at least like video games where i feel like i'm interacting with the story mm-hmm. so tv it was the office for the longest time um and it's mostly cooking shows <laughs> like master chef and master chef junior i love those shows i love gordon ramsay he's my favorite actually for halloween as a family uh my my ex-husband uh he was gordon ramsay I was a Master Chef and my son was Master Chef Junior. Oh, cute. We all That's were precious. And easy costumes. So, yeah, mostly cooking shows. Now I'm watching Nadia baking at home or Nadia's cooking. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the Brit- British, Great British Baking Great show. British Baking Great, Great British, 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 British <laughs> Baking Show. <laughs> so, any sort of food show to get into although lastly I have been getting into some documentaries like Hotel Cecil was one of the latest ones I completed and it's just spine tingling very chilling if anyone hasn't watched it are you into morbid stuff I don't seek it out (laughs) but I do find myself really getting sucked into it I I highly recommend because you said the hotel the Hotel Cecil I love Ask a Mortician on YouTube, and she has an episode. Of, I, I'm not about. I don't know if it's about the hotel or about Eliza Lamb. Oh. So, what's it called again? Ask a Mortician. A mortician. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna check that out then. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we we recently watched a documentary called Murder Among the Mormons on Netflix, and it's oh yeah, uh-huh. only three episodes, which is kind of nice to me because. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I can dedicate myself to like seven seasons of yeah. a show, but they're about an hour each. It's very, very fascinating. I had no idea this was a real thing that happened. All right. That was on my list to watch. So I'll make sure I get to that. I actually, um, uh, I don't know if I could say it shared, or maybe I watched it with the person who has Disney plus because I had Disney plus, I had to give up Disney plus. I had to do some cuts budgeting and stuff. And I finally got to watch WandaVision. I didn't watch the finale yet, but I finally got myself into WandaVision. Is it good? Uh, yeah, it is very good. And what what I like about it, maybe not necessarily because it's Marvel, even though I'm a big Marvel fan, I appreciate the show because every, just about every episode is based off of like a, a decade of, of TV, the era of TV. Like there's a 50s version. There's one in like, the 60s, it's based off of Bewitched and the style of the 70s and the 80s. So it's actually quite brilliant how they feature every episode in a different TV era. So I, I just I appreciate when people put a lot of thought into how they present a, a show. Very oh. creative. Do you like to act or, or have you ever acted before? I was in drama club when I was in high school, but... It was at the boys' school, because I went to a a private all-girl Catholic school in high school. Very interesting. Very fun, actually. Um, But 
The funny thing is I didn't do the drama club in their play, not because I wanted to meet boys at the boys' school, believe it or not. It's because they had singing, and I can't sing. I'm telling Deb I can't sing. So the boys' school had just plays that did not have singing. They weren't musicals. So I would just hop on the bus to Catholic Memorial and just chill with the guys. I was a tomboy anyway, so I kind of felt a little bit more at home there. Um, And I would be in their drama club all throughout high school. Oh my gosh. Tell me about the plays that you did. Um, There's the one that sticks out the most is uh, we acted out a bunch of short stories uh, from Edgar Allan Poe. Ooh. Yeah. That was probably, you know, my favorite one. Yeah. What's your favorite Edgar Allan Poe short story? You think you're putting me on the spot. I know. um, They're going to have to help me out here. Okay. It's like he was talking about the, the fall of, the House of Usher? Yes, that one. Paul, the House of Usher. Yeah, I'm like, all right, I know it to the tip of my tongue. So, yeah, I think that's my favorite. Um, my boyfriend got me this collection of short stories a few years ago from Edgar Allan Poe. And every now and then I'll get a chance to read them because I have to be kind of in the mindset. <laughs> like, Yeah. <laughs> but I, I recently read The Black Cat. Oh, okay. That one was good. And um, yes. I remember, like, The Cask of Amontillado, yep. Telltale Heart. Oh, there's, there, there are a lot that I don't, I, I hate to say lesser known, but maybe that aren't taught in school as yeah. often. Yeah. They, yeah. It's, yeah. It's lesser known. Doesn't mean it's of lesser quality, but you know, there's always like the most popular of each of the renowned authors or artists. And after that play, I went to Barnes and Nobles almost immediately or made my parents drive me there. Um, you know, how Barnes and Nobles kind of re-releases, um, these collect collectors books. So I actually mm-hmm. got an Edgar Allan Poe collector's edition that had all his published works on it. Oh, that's so cool. All his poetry too? All of it, everything. Wow. And my goal was to get through it. Unfortunately, like I never got to it, but uh, maybe someday I can pick it back up again, you know? Do you like any of his poetry? Are, are you into poetry? I am actually. Um, I don't read it on a regular basis, but I, I do have an appreciation for it. Um, I don't know his poems off the top of my head because I had bought that book just to have his collection. And I was reading his stories. I read his poems and appreciate it. But I, I like um, a lot of the more new age stuff, too. I think one of the poets that I like, and I'm pretty sure it's popular, R.H. Sin. Um, I think I've heard that name before. Yeah, if you give me a, a second. Um, it's very powerful. Um, R.H. R.H. Sin puts out... Do, do, do. I wish I could find something like really quick and not bore the listener with me I'm trying know. to figure out. I'm looking it up. Oh, yeah. Um, she felt like feeling nothing. Yeah, just a lot of very emotional... Oh, whiskey words and a shovel. There it is. Whiskey words and a shovel. Whiskey words. Is that is that the uh, the collection of poetry or is that the name of the poem? Yeah, it's a collection. It's a three three book collection. Um, I haven't again gotten through it all. I have a tendency to really buy all these things I want to play and read, but it takes me a long time to get to them. But what I like about it is it's very you know visceral, very real. Sometimes it can be morbid, but you know I, I appreciate it because I feel like a lot of people are maybe afraid maybe and and there's a reason or hesitant to kind of really explore their feelings explore the traumas or whatever that they go through in life but I like reading about it because you know what ultimately we all have these challenges and obstacles in in our life and you, you can connect to it and you don't feel so alone and you really get a sample of the human experience so that's so beautiful, Stephanie, and, and thank you for sharing that because I don't think people realize how important the arts are. If if that dis, if those aspects of life disappeared, I think we would take notice pretty quickly. Absolutely, you know, I've grown up trying to be a little more academic minded, meaning like you know textbooks and stuff like that, mm-hmm. where arts were well. I was told this, so it's not true. I was told that the arts aren't as important. That you got to focus on just you know, main academics, but you know what, that's what makes our culture, preserves our culture, you know, through, and it could be through any medium where it's, um, drawing, right, you know, poetry, um, even like, you know, video games. I think my first ever article that I wrote for AZP and other Zelda podcast was about me attending, um, Symphony of the Goddesses. 
and and how much I love the, the Zelda franchise. And that's a that franchise is a prime example of how video games can be a form of art. Oh, yeah. Did you play Edith Finch yet? I did. You did? Okay, okay. So that that just brings me to think that that game, I had to, like, I was, my mind was just racing. I, I had to reflect on the game after I completed mm-hmm. it. Yeah, definitely. Because when I first, you know, jumped into the game, you know, I thought it was a bit slow, but just because, you know, I'm reintroducing myself back into like a walking simulator type environment. And when I got to the first story, I think it was Molly, Mm -hmm. and you play as Molly and every family member after that has their own way of expressing their story. I was just speechless and just blown away that after I played each session, I probably played in like three sessions. I just had to sit down and just digest everything. It was very impactful. And I I cannot picture experiencing those stories and through any other medium. Like I don't think a movie could do that justice or a book. Not that those aren't important ways of expression and telling a story, but the way that these stories are told and how you experience them through this first person perspective. Yeah. Like um, there's now this is where I might not remember the name of the child. Cause he wasn't like my favorite character, but I, the, what I think of is the teenage boy where he didn't want to go to his father's like second marriage or the wedding. And he was Gust. playing us. Yeah. And he was flying his kite and mm-hmm. you control the kite. So you can, you know, fly wherever. And then the words will follow. So Yeah. It, it tells the story in a dynamic way where you feel like you're you're part of the character, you're kind of living through the character. I don't know. So that medium is just a very unique way to get a um, story across. So that makes me want to know who are some of your favorite authors. Like who who did you like to read when you were growing up, or even if you don't remember their names, like what books did you enjoy? What helped shape your library? <sighs> oh goodness. Other than with Agatha Christie. I'm not sure if I really had too many. I um, read the J.K. Rowling Harry Potter books. I was a Harry Potter fan when I was younger. It just hit, the, I was the right age and demographic at the time. And um, I don't want to belabor the, you know, what so many people know about it, but it was, you know, a fantasy novel series that grabbed everyone's attention. So it wasn't just the content that I enjoyed. Like, I love reading about this you know, poor little orphan boy who was not loved by his aunt and uncle, was whisked away into a magical world, kind of almost dealing with a fate that's bigger than himself, right? Um, So that in itself was just very whimsical and inspiring. But I also loved reading a novel series that everyone else loved because when I was growing up, if you like fantasy and stuff like that, you are considered a nerd. At least that's the environment I was growing up in. Um, and then all of a sudden it became cool to love Harry Potter. And I'm like, oh, good. Everyone can really appreciate um, fantasy and, you know, other other reads. Um, i trying to think. Science fiction, like George Orwell stories I liked. I think, what, 1984? And, yeah, and the Animal Farm. Animal Farm, yeah. So I would say I loved those stories, too. Yeah. Oh, they, they're so good. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of them came from required reading in high school Mm -hmm. and it you know usually if you're forced to read something or do anything you don't want to do it but when I revisited them because I was like bored because again we didn't have iPhones back then when I reread them like I actually like this story it's better when I choose to (laughs) to read it so I've actually kept a lot of my high school required reading books to reread once in a while I have one up here um totally different genre but The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck Oh, yeah. okay. It's okay. A, it's a classic. Um, I like the story because, you know, I'm half Chinese and the story follows, I, I believe, a Chinese family. Um, and, it, you know, it's a, a generational conflicts, you know, between you know father and I think his sons. Um, so it's just very heartfelt and real. So I just, you know what, I'll, I'll shelf it and I'll read it again. Like, I don't ever want to throw these books away. I know it's, Oh, I love that. Are, are you a fan of like Lisa Singh or Amy Tan? Um, it's not that I'm not a fan. I just haven't be, um, been around to read their work yet. So there's so many books, so little time. <laughs> yes, there really is. I just have a whole book. I'm staring at a bookshelf. Actually, my son's um, piling up a, a book collection of himself. So 
Oh, what does he like to read? Um, everything. A lot of them are hand-me-downs, but you know, um, what happens, what is it when you give a mouse a cookie or something Mm -hmm. like that, that series. Um, I have a lot of like old Disney books that I saved for him. Um, he likes, you know, Dr. Seuss, um, the Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. You know, Will there be the- enough room? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I make actually reading um, very important for him. Um, we sit together. I pick a story. He picks a story. Um, so, yeah, we try to read a different story every night. Oh, I love that. That's so important. And you remember those stories as you get older. Oh, exactly. It sticks with you. <laughs> Do you, do you remember any books you read when you were about his age that come to well, mind? Chicka Chicka Boom Boom was, was one. I think it was chicken noodle soup or chicken soup or something. It was a kid who wanted to eat chicken soup. I forgot the, the title of it. And, the re- and I liked it so much, I wanted my mom to buy it. She didn't want to buy it. But this was for, for, smart on her part. I'll give her credit. She actually took the book from the library, made photocopies of it, and she made it into a book for me. That's really sweet. Yeah, it is. Uh, and she, like, colored it on her own. So I'm like, back then, I'm like, why couldn't you just buy it for me? But now I, I actually kept it. I mean, it's all torn up and stuff, but I still keep it. I'm like, oh, she, she wanted to make, make her own version for me. That's extra special. It really is. So, But I, I have fond memories of... Um, going to the school library and renting um, out books. Um, a lot of them obviously have kind of escaped my brain right now, but it's a fond memory. And actually, when I write my, uh, when I write now, I will. I usually, minus COVID, the pandemic, I would go straight to Barnes and Noble. That's usually my first place to go where, when I want to write. Mm-hmm. So I'm surrounded by books. Sometimes I'll pick up a couple, lay them out on my desk, um, just to kind of. Let it inspire me. If I want to take a break, flip through a few pages. There's that Starbucks that's right there. I got my caffeine supply. So, yeah. That, that was actually one of my questions, and, and you answered it, about, like, what helps you to focus on your writing, like the setting, and it sounds like you're in your element at a bookstore. Bookstore or a coffee shop is a nice um, second place. I actually discovered it's relatively new. It's a tea shop. Um, here in New England, you don't see a lot of little tea shops like that. Um, There's usually Dunkin' Donuts, which is awesome. And I love my iced coffee throughout the year, even if it's negative 20 degrees. But it's called Nirvana Tea Shop. And it's one town away, but it's a couple minute drive. And they serve cute, like bits of tea and like a traditional tea kettle. And it's all different kinds of tea, Um, vegan food. I'm not a vegan, but you know, it's delicious, fresh vegan food. And everything's so cute and neat. And you just sit there and there's couches and you just work on your book. And the owner walks through and talks to everyone. And he, he said, you know, my goal for this place is for people to, again, minus COVID, congregate here, work on their projects and just socialize over tea and stuff like that. So I like that. Um, It's not like I don't like working on my my books, my novels at home. It's just that, I don't know, there's a different headspace that I get into when I'm there. And um, I always listen to music. What kind of music do you like? So when I write, I listen to soundtracks, specifically video game soundtracks. It's kind of embarrassing, but they're awesome. They really are mostly Zelda related. I can't stress enough how much of a Zelda fan that I am. It's kind of, yeah, kind of sad, but um, I will put Ocarina of Time OST and I'll just click on it. Um, Or I will just write, you know, relaxing Nintendo music. And it just really puts me in the zone. It really does. awesome. I love it. There's there was a channel that I was listening to that he or she, I'm not sure. Their their avatar is one of the characters from Animal Crossing. <laughs> but they they make these playlists of like best beach songs from video mm-hmm. games, best wintry songs from video games, and my favorite one, elevator music from video games. Elevator music? Like stuff you might hear if you were in an elevator, like one of the, like the Wii shop channel or something like that. Just music. How have I not thought of that? That's, ex- that's what I'm going to listen to next. So it's like what video game elevator music. I'm going to, I'm going to send it to you because Stephanie Please and I do. communicate <laughs> <laughs> pretty often. And I'm going to send it to her if they didn't, if it didn't get like a, a strike, I don't, cause I think YouTube is pretty big on that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. like, you know, if it's not yours, if it's Nintendo, oh. you know, strike it. I always wondered how that worked because, um, you know, some, you know, sometimes I'd watch, well, let's plays are different, right? Or maybe it's 
people on YouTube that discuss a game and they'll sh- display, you know, cut scenes from a video game. And I wasn't sure like to what extent um, companies will strike it. Cause I know, for example, Nintendo, I think Disney too, they're very protective of their IPs. And I just, I, I was very curious. I'm not that's sure. A, that's a good question. I, I, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not, I'm not versed in copyright law, but from what I understand, I think if you're presenting something in an educational manner, like a book club, or you're making like a video essay about it, it's fair game under copyright okay. law. Okay. And now I know it's something that we at Boss Rush have talked about with Twitch, mm-hmm. like um, some games, some companies don't want you to stream their games. I've heard Nintendo's kind of strict. I, I guess they can't go up, after every single streamer, like the little ones, but yeah. not smaller audiences, but I really don't know. And uh, to me, hey, like, if any, hey. yeah, if anyone's listening has experience on that, like, let me know. Cause I am genuinely curious. Me too. Um, I do want to respect the companies and the time um, that they put into creating these things, not to get ripped off. But at the same time, for example, if we're talking about just streaming on Twitch, and maybe I just am not familiar with the Twitch world as much, but I'm, I thought that would be a good promotion for them because the people playing the games, they're not saying, I made this game. It's more like, hey, I'm playing this game made by Nintendo. Let's have fun and hang out. But I could have a very elementary view of it. That's what I would think, too. And the person, unless they were given a, a promotional key to unlock the yeah. game ahead of time, they've probably paid for it with their own money or someone did for right. them. I don't know. <laughs> That's what I would think. Well, it'll be a mystery to me. <laughs> you think you'd ever like to get into streaming? It sounds cool, but I just don't think I have the capacity to do it. I just don't. So I, you know, I, I might, you know, check out other people that stream, but until then, I, I whatever c- creative outlet I have, I gotta put into my writing. Like I'm in the editing stages of my fourth novel, and I need to get that done Uh, only because I've just been dragging my feet on it for so long. Um, So I'm waiting to hear from a couple beta readers um, and then hopefully I'm hoping to get it submitted to my publisher in another month or two. Oh, okay. Awesome. So is it, it's part of the same series or is it something completely different? So I have a um, five book contract with um, Silverleaf books and a, a lot of their products are fantasy and science fiction based. So my, the first three books I put out is the Aeonian trilogy. So that's a trilogy that stands alone itself. The fourth novel I'm working on takes place in the same world because I do love that world, but it takes place, I believe like 500 years after the first trilogy. So a new, new set of characters. Um, it's the stories are kind of in you know lightly intertwined like I'll drop a lot of easter eggs in my current novel for Mm -hmm. those that have read my my previous ones but someone could easily jump into this current one um, and enjoy it just fine I'm really excited about this one because my first few novels you know I was just cutting my teeth on how to you know write and publish professionally and I learned a lot from it and I'm, I'm taking these lessons and applying it to uh, this series. It's going to be a duology, so a two, two book series. Oh, <gasps> that's so cool. Yeah. Looking forward. So, so you've described your favorite kind of setting to write in and that kind of music you like to listen to. Is there a certain time of day or there are certain days you like to write? Sundays are always a, a good day to write. I love I love me my Sundays. There's just something very relaxing and enjoyable, wholesome about it. But um it doesn't matter time of day or day of the week, but what I do need is a chunk of time to focus. Writing is one of those things that I need to get in the zone for. I can't just sit down arbitrarily, bang out a few pages and call it a day. Like I need to mm-hmm. sit down, get in that mood, play that music, have my snacks, have my caffeine, dedicate um, typing for at least an hour. I need at least an hour because um, a page... Like, oh, let me see about, I can probably write about like 2,000 words um, in a se- session and 2,000 words is like an average chapter for me. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, but yeah, I just need a, a dedicated time. But as far as morning, noon, night, it's just whenever I can find the free time. <laughs> 
so what are so that that sounds like related to my question that I'm going to ask next, and I would it might be the answer. What are some of the struggles and challenges of being an author? I feel everyone will have different struggles for sure. Um, I think for me, my number one struggle is that I am my own worst enemy. Half the time, I just want to get the story right the first time around. And that's where I will spend days just writing and rewriting the first chapter. I'm like, I don't like this. Um, there are terms called a planner or a pantser. Um, and in the writing community, we kind of discuss what we are. So a planner is, as you can guess, someone who plans out and plots out their story ahead of time in an outline, very neat and organized. Then there's pantsers. I consider myself more of a pantser where I just kind of write on the fly and see what turns up. But then I criticize myself pretty easily. I'm like, oh, this isn't interesting um, enough. And although I love to tell stories, I, my, my English and my the way I write is really not up to par. Like I have to really undergo a lot of heavy revisions. I tend to repeat words a lot and stuff like that. And I find it very hard to kind of get over myself. I feel like I have to fix them on the spot instead of just write the story, you know, go with the flow and then go back and edit. You can edit anytime. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's kind of, you know, big you know, challenge number one. Um, and then challenge number two is, you know, balance with my, my, you know, my personal life, my work life with, um, writing and then just my overall self-confidence. Like I'll admit, sometimes I go into some dark places and I go, is this even worth it? Is anyone even going to read it or want to read it? So, and I know everybody goes through that. And I just, I want to give those people that advice that people are going to love your story. Um, but I don't really follow my own advice, do I? <laughs> so. How do you how do you handle critics or, or people who are mean online? So knock on wood, I haven't experienced it to that level yet. Um, so I'll you know I'll get back to that um, when I get my first one. But I kind of have mentally prepared myself for that. So I joined a long time ago. Um, so this was in 2017 when I wrote my first book. There's a challenge every November called National Novel Writing Month, or short for NaNoWriMo. And your goal is to write 100,000 words in 30 days. It's crazy, but it's fun. And you can actually meet up with local um, writers. And there were actually write-ins. So I found one for my area in Massachusetts. We met at Barnes & Noble, and we'd write together. We'd have activities, like we'd pick a word from a hat. Okay, the challenge is you have to fit that word in your next chapter. It's crazy. Actually, one of the names of the islands in my novel is based off of um, a word that someone drew from a hat from the writing group. Um, anyway, once that's completed, I got this like discount to join an online writing community called Scribophile. So anyone who likes to write or enjoys writing and just maybe really needs a second pair of eyes without immediately jumping to paying hundreds of dollars for an editor, join a writing community such as Scribophile. You go there, you join a group or don't join a group, whatever, and you can post your stories through karma. It's a point-based system. And you earn karma by critiquing other people's writing. So people exchange critiques. And I'm sure like everywhere else online, there might be some that are kind of a bit tough or uh, tougher on others. But I've seen Scribophiles as a very positive environment. I actually joined a group called the Just Us League. Um, and that's where I got a little bit of you know, confidence and the ability to handle constructive criticism. Everyone in that group is amazing. They're the reason why I was able to get my books published, um, which I'll get back to like negative feedback later. But at least from there, I got to talk to them like, how do you handle negative feedback? I'm afraid of getting this negative feedback. And they explained to me that, you know, when you get to that point, you just kind of got to put your bl two, you can approach two ways. You can put your blinders on it and just not address it. Or, or you could respond but it's just whether or not you kind of have the personality for it like I'm very sensitive <laughs> to everybody who knows me knows I'm very very sensitive so you know I've been told like if you're that way just don't engage because the internet people again it's one thing if you get constructive criticism but it's another thing to be like oh your book sucks and mm -hmm. I, I hate you know you should go jump off a cliff like some people will really just go overboard but you know what? Honestly, I think they feel like they can do it because it's online. They're not saying it to your face. So while I'll still be pretty upset with my first true negative experience, but at least I kind of 
I'm mentally preparing myself. And I did that through my writer's group, which as a side note, um, and this is why I encourage other people to join it. I collaborated with some in that group to publish some anthologies as well. That's so really like what? Okay. Tell me more about that. So we, a few of us came up with an idea to publish short stories in an anthology and each volume would be a theme. So the first one we published was um, fairy tale retellings. So each one of us will pick a fairy tale and tell it in our own way or our own version. It's It was so much fun. The second one was superheroes and villains. That's actually my personal favorite because I was kind of beta testing a future science fiction novel uh, with a short story in there. And I just, I loved it. The third one that I did not participate in only because I just felt like I could not produce a good enough work was horror. So the theme was horror stories or scary stories. I loved reading it. I actually volunteered to be a judge for it and critique it. I just can't pull it off, be scary. <laughs> um, I think our latest one was myths and legends. So, you know, every book's got a type of a theme and I ended up choosing a lot of Japanese based stories. Um, primarily because a lot of the more common ones do get picked up a bit sooner and I wanted to do something a bit different and with my Asian background I'm like well let me let me look at some lesser known so to speak um, legends stories myth folklore and I found just this wonderful treasure trove of stories and I'm like if these anthologies can be a platform for people to learn about these things. I want to be that vehicle. So I retell a bunch of Japanese myths and stories. Um, and that's my contribution to it. I think I have about six short stories published with them. <gasps> okay. Ah, <laughs> so five cool. or six. I lost count. But yeah. God, that is, okay, Stephanie, that's awesome because I love fairy tales. I love myths and legends. I mm -hmm. love fables. I, Ah, oh, because every culture, that's something we all have in common. We all have these legends and yeah. and myths and, mm -hmm. oh. Everyone brings something different to the table. Like, you know, there's your traditional Greek mythology. Then there's, there's actually one, it was um, a, a retelling of Mulan, but it was more like futuristic and, oh, it was great. Like the types of ideas that these writers bring to the table, it's amazing. And I, I, I like writing these short stories. And so for someone that might not have the bandwidth to read a full length 400 page novel, pick up a short story. Um, it makes me more cognizant of short stories. It wasn't just a plug for my writing group and I, um, or discovering folklore, like my latest round of buying, you know, book purchasing, I bought like Irish folklore, um, Native American folklore, which is very interesting, um, and Japanese folklore. Um, so I'm just really into discovering all these stories that I've missed all these years. Were you a fan of Britannica's tales from around the world when you were growing up? I've heard about it, but I never got to experience it, believe it or I not. Think, I think you can find the videos on YouTube. Pat okay. Morita hosts them. Okay. Are you familiar with the concept of it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, where it's um for, for listeners, it's it was this series where Pat Morita would host, and it was it was so cool. <laughs> it was this '90s cartoon, and I had them on VHS. And he would take a, a well-known fairy tale, like uh, let's say Hansel and Gretel, mm -hmm. and he would start with its basis in Germany, and then he would take two other countries where they had a similar story. Oh, mm -hmm. and tell those and they were all animated like they had a sleeping beauty one they had a um, nice. still skin and I, that was just so fascinating because even now but especially as a kid I just was like I want to travel around the world and experience mm -hmm. all of this yeah I'll have to you know check it out and maybe you know if I, I'm sure I'll find it on some platform maybe I can share that experience with my son that'd be he great he might like that it's, yeah especially since it's animated and Okay, mm -hmm. so what if if you have have you traveled abroad before? Yes. Okay, That's I want to hear about it. <laughs> my favorite pastimes, and once we get through all this, I know we're all COVID out when when speaking, but okay. once that's all over, I want to um, start that all over again. I've been to Switzerland, Germany, Italy, Taiwan, China, Japan, and a lot of places. Um, you know, kind of in the Caribbean too. Um, I know I just spat out a bunch of countries, but they they were all so unique and amazing in their own way. Uh, actually, um, one of my favorite domestic trips too was in Sedona. I absolutely adore Sedona. Um, I just love the the red mountains, and we were near the Grand Canyon. 
um, the hiking trails. It's just a, a whole nother world over there. Um, for China, I got to go there twice. Once to visit um, the town or the city where my Nana was from. Um, so that was an amazing experience. Another one was during the 08 Olympics. Um, I didn't go there for the Olympics, but it was when they were still const- um, building everything. And actually, I got to race on the Great Wall of China. Oh my God. Yes. One of the oh. best experiences ever in my life. I'm so jealous. That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, my, my dad kind of had, you know, outshine the rest of us. He did the marathon on the Great Wall where I just oh, did it. dad. I just did like a 5K, I think, with my mom. And I'm like, I'm just here for the experience. Oh, um, my God. The views were breathtaking. I remember one part. I don't know why I think it's funny now. It was kind of scary at the time because, you know, it's a very old structure. There's parts that you, you literally have to hold on to a rope so you don't fall off the side of the, the mountain. And then, you know, there are some racers that are very competitive, like they need to be in the first place where I'm here to just have a good time and run. Um, this like, and I knew he was German cause he was, he was shouting at me in German. I could recognize the dialect. He was like, saying, out of my way. And he was like pushing past me while I'm holding on a dear life with this rope. I'm like, I want to live. Jeez. That's so <laughs> rude of him. I know. Well, he just wanted to win, I guess. I don't know. I, <laughs> but, um, they had all oh, the food. Part of the reason why I travel is to experience the food. Yeah. Taiwan was great. I got to tour uh, around the country because, sorry, like the sun is moving. I'm going to move the glare away. Um, my, that's where my mom grew up. So we did more of a family tour. So I got to see a lot of where the locals eat, where the locals are. And I got to have like, you know, we have fresh chicken, fresh, like purple yams. And I actually had insects. I don't know what insect it was. And I didn't realize I was eating it until I looked closely at what was on my spoon. The eyes were looking back at me and I'm like, ah. Oh, well, so, so did you like it? I did. I mm-hmm. felt weird after I saw the eyes, but I was like, oh, this is crunchy and salty and yummy. And yeah, um. Sometimes it's re- it's really all mental, like in your head, right? Um, mm-hmm. We got to have like hot spring bath, uh, you know, spring baths in the mountains, and climb through caves. And um, finally, Japan, again, one of the hands down one of my favorite places to visit. You know, I went to Tokyo and Kyoto. You know, Tokyo is a place for everybody. There's a section of the city for whatever taste uh, you have. Uh, So the first place I stayed in in the city, in the Shibuya district, we used Airbnb. Mm -hmm. So I actually got to meet um, a Japanese father. um, And it was so cute. Like, I'm I'm so into their culture. Like, I brought them, like, a gift and, um, you know, like snacks, treats for his son because I knew he had a kid. So like, oh, we brought over because I'm from New England and I'm, I'm, I love pumpkin, pumpkin, everything. Everyone makes fun of me for loving pumpkin and say that I'm basic. I don't care if people say I'm basic. I love pumpkin. So I got like little pumpkin treats. Like this is for your son. I'm so happy to meet you. And they're just so friendly over there. Um, and I got to stay at one of his apartments he was renting out. So I got to feel the authentic experience. Um, and like the main cafes and like video games and whatever. But I actually, oh, and sushi. I got to visit one of the famous, um, one of the most famous fish markets in Tokyo where you could literally walk there. You couldn't go into the main fish market area because they only reserve it for, you know, people that are actually purchasing in bulk and stuff. But you can have the freshest sushi you could probably ever ask for in the world done right there. And you can order food through a vending machine. You have hot tea through a vending machine. They have so many things through vending machines. Um, also, I ordered cow trachea. I, I decided to be daring and oh. buy cow trachea. Was, this, the texture was a little tough, but I still powered through and I ate it. I'm an ex- so I like. Funny. Yeah, um, but Kyoto has my heart. So Kyoto was my second stop, and I love Kyoto because of what you can do to explore there. I rented a bicycle, I rode through the city and explored every nook and cranny because there are shrines and temples everywhere. And I'm pretty sure, I forget if it was Miyamoto um, from Zelda or if it was, I forgot who it was, maybe you can remind me, but he grew up in Kyoto and he said he was inspired by the Legend of Zelda or he, the Legend of Zelda was inspired from him exploring 
his Miyamoto. Home, mm-hmm. Miyamoto, yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. all I could think of was that. I'm like, I can understand why. It's so beautiful over here. The landscape, the trees, just everywhere you go. So I literally just got lost in the city and just explored everything. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. So I would love to go back there someday um, amongst, you know, a lot of other places. I'd like to hit up places that are um, have a, a lot of historical significance. Like uh, I'd love to go to, you know, Greece. I've got a little bit of Greek in me as well. I love to travel to Istanbul as well, but you know, we'll see. You know, got to save up a little money in the piggy bank for it. It co- it does cost. <laughs> the flights are so expensive. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was so much fun. I felt like I was picturing these places you were describing, and I oh, I got so excited. Oh, I love it. Yeah. You know, so someday. Um, yeah, and also anywhere where there's good food. Like I, especially, you know, hearing the last podcast, like I mentioned earlier with um, Logan, like anywhere with good barbecue, you know, I'd love to go to Kansas City, um, Memphis, um, Texas, anywhere where there's some good barbecue. And, you know, getting off topic kind of, but it's food, so it's okay. Um, one of my biggest personal achievements was I bought my own um, grill, smoker grill. And it was easy for me because I could handle it myself. Like, oh, I'm a big girl. I can do it by myself. Um, what I liked about it was it can act as a smoker as well. And I actually mastered my own recipe for ribs. Oh, my I God. Down, and I wrote it down. And I'm, I'm going to make it again this year. Yeah. That's congratulations. Ribs are awesome. They are. And, you know, like I said, I, I could probably tinker around with it to get it even better, but not bad for my first try. So I've made ribs on multiple occasions. I've also made brisket. I love it when the brisket's like burnt at the edges. Oh, mm. so good. I just thinking about it. It's grill season. I'm thinking about grilling. I think I'm going to have to eat after this episode. <laughs> I'm so hungry. I think I will too. I'll just be snacking on actually more sun chips probably. Oh, <gasps> sun chips rock. Oh my gosh. Well, do you, do you have any advice for any um, fledgling authors and or people who are interested in getting started in yeah, that yes. medium? Mm-hmm. I know this sounds cliche, but I only say it because I genuinely mean it is just start. When I held, um, I had a stand at book fairs, um, I've had many people come up to me, whether it's themselves or the parents of said person, oh, my daughter loves to write, but she doesn't think it's going to go anywhere, or my son stopped writing because X, Y, Z. I'm like, they should keep writing. I, like, don't give up. I never thought I was going to see the light of day of either artwork or, or writing again when I became a pharmacist, but when you put your heart and mind to it, it is possible. Yes, the rejection rate from publishers are high. I sent my work to 12 publishers before I could land one, I think. Um, But only that, you don't have to do traditional publishing. You can do self-publishing. And there's a lot of flexibility um, within that. And then you learn, you grow, you work social media, you have a uh, website. The way that you gain traction, um, or at least a factor in it, is consistency. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, don't give up, be very consistent. Um, If you have a wide range of ideas, just pick one first. Try not to dabble in a little bit too much. Try and, you know, stay focused on one, you know, hone your craft until you feel comfortable to expand into other things. Um, That's why I kind of stuck with my publisher, which again, shout out to Silverleaf Books because they're wonderful. Um, It's very fantasy and science fiction based because I have like so many other stories, right? Like my story for pharmacy. I want to write a satire. I want to write a a romance novel, whatever. I'm like, you know what? Let me just hone my craft, really get my feet wet with the publishing industry. Um, And then lastly, join a writing community or at least any community that supports the arts, I mean, even just, you know, talking with the folks on the the Boss Rush community, like being able to share your ideas, um, receive support will really point you in the right direction in the end. Oh, that's so sweet. It, it, you need, it takes a village for everything you do. It really does. Yeah. And I, I do believe that writers, artists, we're all very supportive of one another we're always willing to give our personal experience and feedback and, and help. I received a lot of help from writers on Twitter. I've made some friends from writers on Twitter. One of them, he just happened to be like, I don't know, the thousandth follower. So I gave 
his family a copy of my book. And soon we got to talking and I beta read for his book. So, you know, to get his, you know, publishing career started. So, wow. Well. That's awesome. And, and to kind of wrap it up, would you like to talk about uh, any of your awards? Because I, I noticed that you have won some accolades. We have some accolades. Yeah. Going. Yeah, just, you know, just really one main one. I submitted my 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 debut novel, The Aeonians, um, to the uh, Purple Dragonfly. Um, I won the a second place in the Purple Dragonfly Book Award uh, in 2018. So um, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, I kind of looked into how the award system worked. I wanted to find other ways to be able to kind of sell my novel. Like I want to think about it that way. And I, you know, I looked into contests. That's another thing, research. When I was at Barnes and Noble, I'd go into the references section and there'd be books on like, it's like thousands of pages long. It's, it's huge of agent agencies, publishers, and also contests. Um, Cause contests, not just to put a sticker on my book and say I got second place, but also a contest could get your work published. Just, side note for for them but um this um award is is more geared towards um a young adult um reading audience and um when i got that award in the mail and i got a little certificate and a roll of like stickers i can put i can officially put on my book because like i always dreamed of having an award logo on my book and say like i won you know like that means someone really liked my book and it's not just me <laughs> so it's very validating. I think everybody deserves a little bit of validation. Everyone seeks it. Yeah. And they do. They do. And I lied. One more topic for you, Stephanie. Yeah, and let's, talk, let's talk about AZP. Let's talk about another yes. Zelda podcast because you are a new writer. Welcome to the team. Yes. As of November, I believe I met you. Yes, yes. Um, I'm very, very excited to be um, a contributing writer for the AZP blog. Um, that was the first podcast I got into when I started listening to podcasts. And I think it's um, Dave and Kate, right? Mm -hmm. Dave and Kate. Yeah. They just have a great dynamic together. The topics that they discuss. I love the format and they got very suit, like, especially Dave has got a very soothing voice. Like I feel very like calm and like, okay, very Zen. And, um, you know, I started, you know, interacting with everyone on social media and when I was asked to possibly write for the, for the blog, I just had my moment. I'm like, me? Me? I've been selected to write about <laughs> Zelda, the thing that I love the most? <laughs> so, you know, talking about doing what you love. So at first I had you know, a little mini internal crisis, like, what am I going to write? Like, I put a lot of pressure on myself. Like, I want to be able to put out good content that people will like. I want to be able to pull my weight. Um, but I figured, you know what, just start with your own personal experience. And that's where I started with writing about Symphony of the Goddesses. I think what I might be working on is doing like a little mini, um, like a, a book club review of sorts of things that I am reading or going through. So I want to write about the Zelda cookbook. Yeah. And the psychology of Zelda. Oh, <gasps> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, really, you know, since we talked about psychology not too long ago, it's um, a book with, you know, a couple of pieces in there by tried and true psych psychologists, those with PhDs, and they analyze various aspects um, of the series, like how people project themselves on Link, like, you know, something like that, or, mm -hmm. you know, Majora's Mask, the stages of grief. Um, but, you know, because, I, you know, I'm a nerd and I love science, like, it really I don't know. I'm not saying the theories before I read this were invalid or anything, but just the fact that we have like real experts actually like dissecting into it, I can get very technical and enjoy it. So I figured, you know what, I want to be able to discuss stuff like that on um, AZP because what I love about Zelda is a lot of people just kind of take off and do their own thing. And I love a lot of, you know, fan based products that came from the series. So hopefully, you know, I can get a couple recipes under my belt and take some pictures. Um, and put it um, on the blog. Um, I want to make those potions, you know, like green potion, red potion. I want to make those. <laughs> so far, I've just made the beef stew. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. That's the first one I made too. <laughs> well, it seemed like the least intimidating one, and I did it on a weekend. And yeah, how'd you like it? It was good. Very, very good. Really good. Um, 
And it was an easy way to make beef stew because there could be other more traditional recipes that are a bit time consuming and difficult. I think another reason why, you know, I was kind of hesitant with the others is there's some ingredients um, that I don't have readily available in my pantry. So I'm like, all right, I'll just save that for a weekend where I just buy a whole bunch of ingredients for the Zelda cookbook and just kind of, mm-hmm. you know. I want, I want to try that fish pie. Hmm. That one looks so, really good. Yeah. It's something that I would definitely need to follow the recipe very closely for. I can see myself butchering that. Me too. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be as pretty as the one. It'll in the turn book. out dubious. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a dubious food. Yeah. <laughs> I think there actually is a recipe for dubious food, isn't there? I, I think know. there is. Um, I actually entered their contest last year. I, I didn't win, but I made, uh, like, they wanted to see recipes that they didn't have in there that were Zelda inspired. So I made a wedding cake for Andrew and Cafe and awesome. inspired by, like, uh, Louisiana wedding cakes. Because MJ Kuhn and I were talking, I guess we were talking about food, of course. You can't yeah. talk to me and not talk about food. But she was, I was like, yeah, wedding cake flavor is one of my favorite snowball, uh, snow cone flavors. And she's mm. like, there's a specific flavor for wedding cake. And apparently Louisiana wedding cakes might be a little different mm-hmm. than other regions. Wedding cakes. I, I have no idea. <laughs> but then I also, you remember in Majora's mask, how she always messes up her cooking. Yes. I yes. thought, I thought she needed a little redemption. So I made redfish cubion, which is another uh, Louisiana recipe. And I was like, and you stew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's so, awesome. Sounds delicious. There's a lot of great and unique flavors down in Louisiana, I got to tell you. Mm. Did you come here before? I have. I've been, I'm trying to think, maybe twice. One was during a, a pharmacy conference. I was a student, and we, you know, it's like a networking opportunity. But okay. while I was there, I'm like, well, I could just kind of explore the city and try out all the delicious food, you know, the beignets. Yeah. I love beignets and, you um, know, gumbo and stuff like that so just I love the the spice the flavors like I'm all about flavors and you made me laugh when you're talking about pumpkins earlier I'm like girl I love pumpkin stuff okay, give me okay. all the pumpkin stuff how do people make fun of me I'm like oh why do you like pumpkin I'm like pumpkin the best pumpkin pie pumpkin coffee pumpkin everything pumpkin seeds yes I too like too. pumpkin seeds there's a book there's a children's book called too many pumpkins have you heard of it no, I'm going to, I'm going to send it to you because it's really cute. <laughs> yeah. I hope you've been writing down the laundry list of things you need to send me. Uh, it's okay. I will. I promise I will. But is there anything else you'd like to let people know about you or about writing or about Zelda? Anything? <sighs> um, well, Zelda is awesome. Um, you know, if you haven't tried it, you know, you play play any of their games. Breath of the Wilds are a great introduction for younger gamers that are more used to the better graphics and the open world gameplay. Um, as far as you know about me or about my writing, like you'll see me. Um, you know, I'm I'm trying to get myself more involved uh, with um, Discord on Boss Rush, um, Twitter. I've taken a hiatus from Facebook and Instagram for a while just for a digital detox, but I'll be back on there. Um, I want to encourage anyone out there who has a passion for any sort of creativity, whether it's producing YouTube content, blogging, writing, drawing. I even want to get back to, you know, publishing a graphic novel. Like, don't give up. Just start. And if you are in a point in your life where maybe you're starting a family, starting a new job, transitioning from different home, like apartment to house or whatever, that's okay. Never strike something that you enjoy from your list. If you just need to do a, a little bit of time, dedicate a little bit to the side, keep it going. Um, and this is me sending a message to you, anonymous listener. I'm cheering you on. I know you can do it. Oh, oh, that's my that's, last message. That's, I got the warm fuzzies again. <laughs> Gotta have the warm fuzzies. There's way too much negativity out there that I don't mind being the obnoxious, warm, fuzzy person. <laughs> I love it. We need that. And where can people find you, Stephanie, if they'd like to follow you? Yeah, sure. On Twitter, I'm at Klimov underscore author, K-L-I-M-O-V. I think Instagram is the same thing, Klimov underscore author. And then Facebook, it's the same, but without the underscore, at Klimov author. So Excellent. I try to be consistent. <laughs> and be sure to read her stuff on anotherzeldapodcast.com. We did her first collaboration. Well, it was her first piece. It was a collaboration piece where we talk about our dream desti- destinations yes. we could go on vacation and she has her her piece about the symphony of the goddesses and more coming 
Yeah, thank you. And actually, if people want to check out my website, it's not just a plug for me, but because mm-hmm. I will be publishing my inter- uh, my interview of MJ Kuhn's novel. So it's really me for like, I want to share her achievement, um, which will be coming in the next two weeks. My website is Um and, or if you are a writer and you want, you know, a plug or if you want an interview, hit me up there. I'll be happy to have an interview with you guys. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Stephanie, for your time today. And listeners, you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts, bossrushgames.com. And until next time, we'll see you later. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.